Hello, so I haven't made a video in like seven months. If you're one of the subscribers who still is amazingly subscribed to me after all this time, thank you so much for sticking around and welcome to anyone who has subscribed in the last seven months. Um, I always got kind of a surprise when people would still be subscribing to my channel even though my last video was in October. There wasn't really any massive reason why I stopped. I just kind of couldn't get up the motivation to make a video every weekend. I would tell myself you should make a video and I just never ended up doing that. And so I was sort of questioning to myself whether YouTube is something I really want to keep going with. But it's definitely not the fact that I don't want to make videos. I think it was more the fact that I was in like a massive reading slump and still kind of am really. Not that I really like using the word slump. It's more that I think I'm more impatient with books than I used to be. If I'm not vibing with a book instantly basically then I just put it down and so having less books to talk about and not being that enthusiastic about the books that I was reading made me feel like I didn't have much to say in any kind of videos that I wanted to make. I think the time that I used to spend reading and the passion that I had about reading new books has kind of been replaced with films. This channel may merge a little bit into a book slash film channel simply because I just have more to talk about in regards to films than I do books at the moment. I feel like there is so much room on YouTube for like booktube style videos about film. So I have ideas around videos that are about film but hopefully bring more of that booktube aesthetic to it. But I still will definitely keep making videos about what I've been reading. Today's video is actually focused on books. Um, I thought I'd just go through what I've read so far this year, which is basically like a half year wrap up. I've read 11 books in the year, which is not on track for my reading goal. Let's get into it. So first I decided to read um, Swallows and Amazons by Arthur Ransom. It's sort of been like a vague tradition where I reread one of my favourites from childhood at the beginning of the year over the Christmas break. This was truly one of my favourites when I was a child. I wanted so bad to be one of the Walker siblings or even just like their friend or something. I just wanted to be part of this group of children that got to live on an island and camp with no adults around and the oldest is like probably 13. It just seemed like the dream even though I don't like camping and <laughs> as a kid certainly wouldn't have liked camping either. It's really interesting reading children's fiction especially that I used to love because I find a lot of the time my imagination has really filled in gaps where the books can actually be a little bit boring. If you don't know the story, it's about these four siblings in the Lake District in the UK in the 1930s who are on their summer holiday. They all love sailing and so their mum lets them go off in this sailboat to go camp on this island. And then they meet these two girls who live in the area who had already camped on the island before and claimed it as their own and so they become friends but they also start this war with each other kind of thing. And so like the most memorable part of this book is when they actually have the war. They decide they're going to try and capture each other's boats and so they both try different tactics on how to do that. But that bit of the book is genuinely only in the last third, if not last quarter of the book. Most of the book is just them hanging out on the island, cooking, doing the dishes, like there's a lot of descriptions of that. It's definitely not bad, but I definitely found the writing a little bit simplistic. I found it quite repetitive. And then of course you've got the whole thing of Susan, the oldest girl. I mean, she loves cooking, so that's like fair enough. There was a recent adaptation of this book and they reversed Susan's character and made her bad at cooking as if like that was a feminist statement because how dare the woman like cooking, which it doesn't work like that. Cooking is a traditionally female trait, but like that doesn't mean it's a bad thing if a woman enjoys it. So that's not an issue for me, but the, the girls always do the washing up and the boys go off to do something else. So that's annoying as well, but it's the 30s, what are you gonna do? But yeah, it was just a little bit slow at the beginning and it kind of surprised me because in my head this was such an action-packed book that it really just shows how much my brain was kind of actively working while reading this and almost like the book was just a starting point for my brain to go off in all kinds of directions which I think is a lovely thing that children's fiction can do for children. So anyway I was a little bit disappointed it wasn't like the fast-paced read that I remembered it as. I kind of still, I mean I own the entire series so I kind of want to keep going and See if the writing picks up a little bit considering this was his actual first novel anyway. Next I read Passing by Nella Larson. It was published in 1929 and it's about these two black American women living at the time in the 20s 
who are able to pass for white and it is about the different ways that they react to this. Claire is married to a white man who is super racist and would probably kill her if he found out she was actually black. And then you have Irene who has gone the opposite way. She has married a black man and they live in a black community in New York, in Harlem, and they're like very much involved in civil rights and that kind of thing. But we do see Irene use her passing privilege to sort of go about her day and like shop in places where she otherwise would have been turned away from and that kind of thing. It was such an interesting read. It was this uber short, tiny little story that just packs a punch. There's a film adaptation that's been made. I think it's only been released at festivals, so it's not out for general release yet. But that has Tessa Thompson and Ruth Negger starring and I'm so excited to see the adaptation. I think it'll be really, really good. So yeah, would recommend that one. Next I read Hangersman by Shirley Jackson. My mum asked me what I wanted for Christmas. I said I wanted Shirley Jackson books. I had to write down the ones I've already read to make sure that she didn't get those ones. This is her second novel. It's based on a real life disappearance of a college student near where she lived, but that aspect doesn't actually come into it until the very end. What it's really about is this girl called Natalie who is a daughter of a writer who's gone off to college and she just struggles with like her father's overbearing nature and her mother being really neurotic, but she also doesn't fit in at college because girls there are snobs basically. It was really weird. Like it was a very, very weird book. I didn't really understand everything that was going on. And I know Shirley Jackson is weird, but The Haunting of Hill House and We Have Always Lived in the Castle, they made sense to me. Like I could understand what was going on and I got quite lost in this book. I just found it random rather than insightful or meaningful. I was a bit disappointed with this one, especially because like, the front cover is made for me. She's got red hair. But I did read another Shirley Jackson book, which we'll get to later on, which was really good. So I still love her. I still love Shirley Jackson. <laughs> Um, then I read The Millstone by Margaret Drabble, which I just randomly found in an op shop and the cover was cool and the concept sound cool, so I picked it up. Um, it is about, what's her name? <sighs> this is why I need to review books after I've read them, because I don't remember any of the details once I finished it basically. Rosamond, her name is Rosamond, and she is a young woman living in 1960s London and she has never had sex. She's had boyfriends and actually at the beginning has like two boyfriends on the go but somehow convinces each of them that she's having sex with the other one and doesn't want to have sex with them. You so rarely read people who have just simply not had sex and they're like this is fine like it's not a big deal but then a third guy comes along she has sex with him once and she gets pregnant and so then there's kind of discussions about abortion but she does decide to go ahead and have the child so it talks about being a single woman going to these medical facilities it is a really interesting snapshot of a particular time and place it's written in the first person from Rosamond's point of view and she has actually quite a dry way of talking I felt like the way the character was writing was very surface level like you felt like you weren't really getting a real insight into her emotions but then maybe that's how someone of that era would have written anyway because it's like they're British they don't talk about their emotions so it kind of worked but also I wanted more I guess out of it and then when she actually has the child the child is just like a perfect baby that felt a bit unrealistic to me it felt like the author was taking shortcuts but she wanted the book to go in a particular direction and she couldn't be bothered worrying about like what it actually might be like to have a newborn she also lives in her parents apartment and her parents are like away in another country although she's not super wealthy she doesn't actually have to worry about rent or anything so there's that as well which is like another shortcut you can't really blame a book for not being what you wanted it to be though so I'm still glad I read it. So then I read uh, Laurie Love Me Best by Robin Klein. I like started reading this ages ago and then kind of didn't finish it and so I just saw it on my shelf it's like you know what I'm gonna actually finish rereading this book. Robin Klein is my favorite kids author. She's an Australian kids author who was writing books in the 80s and 90s for the most part and as you can see I got this one as I did most books when I was a child from a library discard sale. This was published in 1988 and like obviously being born in the 90s a lot of the libraries that I went to had books published in the 80s and the 90s that I then read when I was a little bit older but like the library still had the books from that time. So I felt like I read a lot of books that came out way before I was born, but they were just there. Anyway, I love Robin Klein. The way she writes is so engaging. Her characters are just, you instantly understand everything about them. This is not one of her most well-known ones. It's about these two friends who each get chapters from their points of view and they each have problems going on with their families. Andre, her mum is like a hippie and so they go live in like a hippie commune up in the mountains and she hates it. And then Julia, her parents, 
are constantly like snipping at each other and um, her dad is extremely overbearing and her brother then leaves as soon as he turns 18 so she has that going on but they don't talk about these problems with each other and they assume that the other has a perfect life and so that kind of causes some rifts when they find this abandoned house near their fancy private school and decide they'll hang out there after school to get away from their families and then this boy called Laurie rocks up and they each fall for him and that obviously causes arguments between the two. The plot with the random boy that shows up is definitely the least interesting part even though it's like the main part of the title but this is a great example of how Robin Klein can write from the perspective of the character who are clearly blinded to their own issues and their faults and that kind of thing. They're usually not that self-aware and yet we as the readers know exactly what's going on and can see through their own blind spots which is just such smart writing especially for kids fiction I think and the fact that as a kid I also got all those nuances in between the writing. So that aspect of it made it really fun for me to read and it was very nostalgic. So I, I read a non-fiction book next called Women vs. Hollywood by Helen O'Hara. She is on the Empire Film Podcast, which is my favourite podcast. The Empire Film Magazine is like one of the most famous ones in the world. It's a British magazine. Three main hosts are just like the nicest people. Helen obviously talks about the fact that she wrote this book, so I was like, well, I'm definitely going to buy that. And it was really interesting. I couldn't tell you any of the facts from it because as I've said, as soon as I finish a book, I forget everything about it, which is really unhelpful when reading non-fiction when the whole point is to be learning things. I did learn some stuff about how film originally, when it was like invented in the late 1800s, was originally the domain of women. So many of the original silent movies that are not around anymore were directed by women, written by women, really creative and inventive for the time, and quite outspoken about certain issues sometimes as well. But of course, once film became profitable, mental quote and basically shut women out over the course of a few decades. You know, women still had top billing during the 1940s, like equal with men, but basically sort of during the 50s and by the time the 60s came along, women were kind of shut out and everything was very male dominated for a long time. So it was kind of a sad book to read, to be honest, because it was like interesting first chapters about stuff I never knew. And then the rest was like, well, this is just depressing. Women got shut out of the industry who could have become amazing creators, but weren't given the same access to it as men were. Definitely would recommend if you are at all interested in film. It's really insightful. Next, I read another nonfiction book called No Shame by Tom Allen. Tom Allen is a British comedian who I absolutely love. I think he's so funny and I just relate a lot to what he says. So I thought I would really love this. This is a autobiography-ish memoir about growing up as a young gay child in a place where that was considered a very strange thing to be and it was very interesting I think especially the stuff about him growing up and his school life and just the extraordinary things he did as a child like once hosted um, like a full-on dinner party for a group of friends including like a guy he had a crush on and was worrying about the order of the forks and the spoons and the plates that he was using and that kind of thing and he just kind of is bemused by himself because as a kid he just kind of couldn't not be himself the force of his own nature made him unable to be anything but his authentic self pretty much. He and his family just sound so lovely. They sound like my family and they have the same interests as us. Talks about him and his mum going to visit National Trust homes and like watching the same TV shows and that kind of thing. And it's definitely very funny as well. Tom Allen is just naturally very very funny. But I didn't feel like I was getting the kind of insight that I wanted. It felt like he was holding back a little bit which he has a right to obviously. But I guess I was hoping for a bit more and in the end it kind of felt a little bit repetitive. If you like Tom Allen, I'd still recommend it. It's still very much his personality. Then I decided to read Franny and Zoe by J.D. Salinger. I read Catcher in the Rye when I was a teenager and hated it so much. So I vowed never to read Salinger again. But I watched the movie My Salinger Year, which I really loved. So I kind of like reluctantly was like, oh, well, if Margaret Qualley's character likes Salinger, maybe I'll like it now. Uh, no, I still don't like it. Still didn't understand the point of it. I didn't think the writing was amazing. I mean, I could sort of see theoretically how clever the structure of the sentences is and like these characters are so blustering and talk so much and you still very much see how sad they are underneath all that language that they use. So in that respect it certainly is clever I guess. I just don't connect with it in any way. It was such a short book and it took me so long to finish so just a reminder to me to never read Salander again. So then I read what is my favourite book that I've read so far this year 
fake accounts by Lauren Euler. I really couldn't tell you why I love this book exactly. It's just something that I found really enjoyable about the tone of voice. I think I've said this before on this channel, but for me, I love a writing style that is self-aware and has a sense of humour about itself and knows that as important as the events of the book might be to the characters, it's still just a novel. Like, it's, it's no big deal. This definitely had that all the way through, even though it is actually written in first person from the unnamed protagonist, who is very clearly a stand-in for the author. It has this sort of plot aspect where the main character um, discovers that her boyfriend is secretly running a conspiracy theory Instagram account, but for me I didn't really feel that that was like a huge part of the book. It's really just this girl musing about the internet and you know how she's constructed this life for herself on the internet and now doesn't really know how to live in the real world. That's what I got out of it anyway, and I found that very very fascinating. I think that might be a real thing for a lot of people, especially if you're someone who hasn't found a lot of connections in your real life, which is a lot of people, including myself, and you have instead found these connections online and you've created this persona for yourself online, like not necessarily a fictional persona, but like online you can very easily just show the bits of yourself that you like the best or think are most appealing to other people and that helps your self-worth because you are now this person that you've always wanted to be and in the real world it's harder to control the way others perceive you. I can imagine that could be really jarring and it kind of made me very grateful that I don't have an online personality, I don't think. I mean there's this YouTube channel but like this is just me talking and so I can't really hide who I am. If I can edit it to like edit out stupid things that I say so I don't get cancelled or anything but it's still just me talking so it's kind of still is just me. I don't feel like I have a very strong internet personality compared to people who get really famous on the internet obviously. I feel like my personality is more successful in real life than it is on the internet which hopefully is a healthy thing. <laughs> um, so anyway for me it was very insightful to read about someone who I think is probably around my age who has had the opposite experience with the internet. It didn't really come to any conclusions it's just kind of very observational and I found it just really engaging which <laughs> as I said before is something that I'm struggling with books so I just to find something that I wanted to read was very exciting. And now we come to the next Shelley Jackson book I've read so far this year, which is actually the first of her two memoirs, Life Among the Savages. This chronicles her and her husband moving to Vermont with their two children and also covers the time in which they have two more children. And I think each chapter was published in separately before she put them together in one volume. And it's just like the exact opposite of her fiction, which was so fascinating to read about. It's definitely not like a tell-all. The way she talks about her husband doesn't quite match up with the way you read about him on Wikipedia, um, about him being like kind of controlling, so she doesn't really talk about those aspects, but the way she writes about her children is hilarious. They are insane in like a great way, and it was very reminiscent, I guess, of books I used to read as a kid with large families. I just really loved seeing another side of her, and it made me think about that film that came out recently with Elizabeth Moss called Shirley, which is based on a fictional novel about her. That film was not trying to be like a an accurate biopic but it completely deleted her children like her children didn't exist in the film it made her and her husband really weird it was based on a time of her life when she was suffering from mental illness and so I understand why they went in that direction but for me it's like we think women can't be interesting if they're actually just being mothers and doing the housework I think it simplifies women if we think we should just cut that bit out of her life because we want to focus on the, the more weird wacky side of her that film annoyed me a lot in that respect Respect. So I really liked reading this memoir and seeing that side of her because obviously that was just as important to her as her novels. It did make me angry as well because she was doing so much around the house and her husband was not doing anything at all. She was like heavily pregnant and still making breakfast for everyone. I know it's a different time but like surely if you're a decent man regardless of what society tells you you should do you would be like no I'll do the breakfast today because you're heavily pregnant about to give birth. Would recommend if you're a Shirley Jackson fan it's so interesting to see this different aspect of her life. And the most recent book that I've read so far this year is Nocturnes by Kazuo Ishiguro. This is his collection of short stories. I didn't think about this before I started reading it, but it makes sense now in that every story is about music. I actually listened to an interview with Kazuo Ishiguro on Adam Buxton's podcast, and he mentioned how he played music when he was younger and wanted to be a rock star, and 
so you can see his passion for music really coming out in these stories. I am a renowned short story, not a hater, but I just don't get along with them very well. To me, I guess a lot of short stories are like, they had an idea for a character and they just wrote a chapter and then were like, well that's done, I'll just call that a short story. It's like, well, no, I feel like a short story should not just feel like a chapter of a novel, it should feel like its own thing. I have read short stories that I do like, which feel like they do need to be a short story, if that makes sense. Anyway, this I found kind of boring. The main characters were all these like middle-aged men who were obsessed with the idea of the integrity of being a musician and you've sold out if you're just playing like commercially or playing covers in a band to make a living, like that's not real music. I'm sure Ishiguro was making a comment on those people and not saying they were great, but it's still not fun to read about, like they're very annoying. Don't know what I achieved by reading that, just a reminder that short stories are really not for me. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any recommendations of books that will get me out of this slump, please let me know in the comments, especially if you've read a book that came out this year or last year that you thought was really good let me know. I really love reading new books, like I love reading a book that's come out this year and feeling like this is the literature of now and it's reflecting on the times that we are in. I love that, but I'm just not finding many that I enjoy, like Fake Accounts is the only one that I've stuck with to the end. So if you've read a new book especially that you think I'd like, please let me know in the comments. Hopefully it will be less than seven months until my next video, so I will see you then. Bye!